And so let's start. Um, last week I've been reviewing um, Xue Han's um, Interrupt the Future. I, I think it's, a, it's safe regarding to to the concern that some some unrelated um, client request could be could sneak in when the when the original one is is still on fly, so they are not likely to be interfered with each other. So I think that uh, there are two pending issues. I I will let Shihan elaborate on them later later on. Um, but one of them. I could help on with it. Um, that is uh, the the recovery of a uh, blocked object context because to ensure that the the current requests are correctly um, sequenced, we introduce a uh, object con a contact lock concept as as we did in the classic OSD, but. Uh, but when a PG acting set changes, we, we need to unlock the object context. So I think probably the right way is to, to use the with, with lock primitives to ensure that the, the unlock is always caught. So I'm trying to refactor the existing uh, with underscore objects, object context block to use the with lock um, primitive. And that's it. Um, I don't know. Hi everyone. So for the past week, I've been trying to uh, build my uh, my PR regarding uh, PIO handling, and I stumbled across many uh, uh, compilation errors, which uh, suggested to me that perhaps the the place I chose to um, actually do the handling is uh, wrong. Well, in the in my uh, draft PR, I made it in PG backend, and after trying to build, I think that 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 is not the correct place because one is not aware of of some information we need from the PG because it doesn't have a a reference to the PG, and second of all, it is not aware of of recovery. Um, so the after um, talking with uh, Radek Shuan. And careful, I think the the right move would be to to move it to to pg to pg dot cc and um and have a small portion um of it in client request when we need to to restart the op if we if uh, we return it again. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Sharon, did you get? A, oh, sorry, Amnon, did you get a chance to um, to look into the reason why we we need to start put the PG into recovery when we we run into? You mean the, repair? Uh, yes. Uh so I tried to I tried to look yesterday, and my my understanding of of this state is that it just means that. Um, uh, in in the in the next uh, scrub, uh, it will try to re re repair the PG, but I, I'm I'm not sure if we, if it'll be um, blocking any further requests. Okay, so, that's a relief. But 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 I guess we should we should discuss it later. Um, with Sam. Um, have you written down a document explaining sort of what your design is? Uh, I think no, that would there... be a good idea. Add a doc, add a .rst file to the doc crimson directory with like eio handling.rst, and then write a quick sketch of what the overall goals are, and then where you plan to implement it, and how. Okay. Yeah. I think that'll yeah. help reviewers. Okay, I will do that. Um, ping me once you've got that uh, written, and I'll try to have a look. Okay. So, okay, should we should we do the discussion that we planned after I write the document, or? Well, I'm happy to discuss it now, or after yeah. the meeting. So let's do it after the after the round of the sync up. So let everyone talk, and then we can discuss it. I guess.
Bye bye me. I to have a short discussion based on which we could could write up have the document and explain yep. it later on. Okay. Okay, so that's that's it from me in the meantime. Uh, uh, May. Um, I have already um, pushed the the Google Map Tree PR uh, to review. Uh, and uh, um, I'm con considering the next uh, the tasks. So um, uh, I have a question: Do we need a separate tree for the collection to save to store the C node information? I don't think so. I'm sorry. What's up? Um, for the collection, because collections uh, uh, store the C node information in the rocks DB in blue store. So what's a C node? Uh, something like PG information. What is it for, and what does it do? Uh, they save the collections. Uh, Um, oh, I see. For enumerated the collections, PGID something. Some, PGID so something. So that you can enumerate the set of collections? Um, I guess we might need to support that, but does anything in Crimson currently use that interface? I think uh, for for enumerated the, the existing PGs, we need to understand what uh, what what we have in uh, in. Uh, on a disk. I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we know what the, uh, if we know, I suppose. I don't think we have it. This, this I don't see any reason to, like, block. we could create a special, there's already a special OSD meta object, right? So why not simply list the set of uh, PGs in that? You mean the, the meta, meta collection, right? Is that what it is? I'd rather create the ability to create objects that are definitely not Rados objects. Look, the only purpose from what you guys are telling me is so that we know, like when we boot up, how many, uh, what PGs exist. Yeah. So the question is, why can't we use the existing interfaces already in Object Store to do that? Why does this have to be special? What's interesting about this? We have a number of, of special objects already present in the OSD. All of the PGs have a meta object, which is represented by like a, an empty, um, an empty, uh, like just the hash with empty other fields. So I forget exactly how it's constructed, but it's a perfectly normal object. Similarly, I believe there is an OSD meta object and all of the OSD map objects are stored as normal objects. So why not simply store like, a single object that just has a list of all the PGs on the OSD. Yeah, we can have it in the meta collection as well. There, sure, but in this context, there really wouldn't be any such thing as a collection. Not really. Yeah, I just as a metaphor, it's a it's a yeah a sing, single term of, for 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 collecting all the global things like super super. Blocks I get it, and, but what I'm pointing out yeah. is that the collection concept would no longer be an on disk concept in Z Store if we did it that way. We just wouldn't use that. There'd be no point. Mm. Makes sense to me. What do you think, Trimay? So like we, we used really the collections in Crimson, is I think what I'm asking. Okay, so can you give me a couple of, uh, I can't follow up with you, Sam? What's up? Uh, no, what's because up? I'm just, I'm right now I'm just talking out design concepts. What I'm saying is you haven't told me what the C note is for. So it's not yeah. obvious why we would need one. You know that you store some some PGID information. What PGID inf inf information? Uh, P PIs. In, in blue star, it is PI, some uh, MC, something. It's literally just the PGID? Then yeah, it's just a representation of the collection itself. It's vestigial. It's a holdover from when file store used to use actual directories for, for collections. I. It's not obvious to me that collections are a useful concept to Z store. Where so my my suggestion to you is that you write up a document outlining what Crimson currently uses collections for and what the easiest way to support that usage would be. Okay. Don't just reference Blue Store. 
Okay. But we still the, the interface we still need the collections. So no, collections we don't. We, have, we can change we the don't. interface if if we want to. We can do uh, whatever oh. we want. Oh, uh, oh, see, I, I see. Right now, the interface largely parallels classic OSD, but it doesn't have to. So if there's a compelling reason to keep collections and to actually embed that down in C-Store, then I'm open to that. But if there isn't, why bother? So, so each PG has uh, one collection, and one collection has stored the object information, uh, or all node map, I think. So each collection has one all map, all node map. That's not true. Oh, not true. No, and the reason for that is that you need to be able to split a collection in constant time, or at least in nonlinear time. So if a PG split comes in, we have to be able to split a collection into two collections based on the change in PG seed very quickly. So it would be extremely bad if every collection had its own ONO tree. Okay. Um, so do you think each PG has uh, has one collection? Do we keep this concept? I don't know because I haven't been given a good reason to do so. It's kind of up oh. to you, right? Present an argument. Oh, okay, I see. My suspicion is no. My suspicion is that all we currently use it for is listing the set of current PGs. I'm open to suggestions, though. If you think it's a useful concept, then in learning that, I think you'll discover what we need to add to C-Store. Yeah, I see. So I will do some investigation on it and uh, cool. uh, try to give some design document. So does that mean that we might need to drop the uh, compat compatibility to Alien Blue Store if we find finally find that collection is not? No, new. I think what we do is we would simply say Blue Store uses collections and the interfaces continue to use them, but C Store ignores them. Which is pretty much what it already does. Collections only barely exist in Blue Store. For instance, there's no difference in the object name spacing for objects in different collections. The collections aren't a prefix. There's no. Mm -hmm. There's nothing special about them. Okay, just, really just, just don't use collection in Blue Store, right? Like. You would still have to use them. The interface requires it. But you, as long as you don't rely on them for anything, then C Store wouldn't be able to tell the difference. If we simply ignored the parameter, nothing would would change. Yeah. Like what? Yeah. What behavior? My my challenge to you is what behavior is actually different because of a collection? What does Blue Store use them for? I can have a look at it myself if you want, but that's that's the question I would I would I would go find out. I would I would go read it, find out what what that design actually relies on them for, find out what the OSD uses them them for, and then evaluate whether that's a sensible thing to do. I did a quick research last last night, and some existing document puts that uh, the the collection ensures the ordering of the uh, accessing of the object hooked by collection. But I can I think that's actually that the op sequencer, yeah. not the op, not the collection. Yes, which those which, are two which separate is concepts. In the code, not the, uh, on the disk layout of the. No, no. I mean, the there's a second. Op, there are two different objects in 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 play. One of them is the collection, the the call T CID thing. The other is we actually pass an explicit op sequencer in in Blue Store, right? No, that's what we have to have that in, in in Blue Store, so. No, no, I know I'm talking about Blue Store. What I'm saying is the collection isn't what determines ordering. The op sequencer is. Hmm. I think the I think Kifu is right. The, the documents do specify the collection as the ordering. That's because right now every collection has an op sequencer. But if you go read the code, you'll notice that actually Blue Store doesn't use the collection as the sequencer. It uses the sequencer as the sequencer. I believe. Yes. Let me go check. Thanks. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, that's all for me. It's changed. Mm. I don't know. Hi everybody. Um, first, about apart from uh, reading PRs and hopefully starting to read more reason-related ones, uh, I'm doing a, a rebase again of uh, the scrubby code, and we after fixing uh, a bug there. Okay, I have two questions uh, on this in this regard. 
Uh, first, Sam, uh, you answered about uh, the handle, the, uh, the thread pull handle, which is uh, sent to many, uh, you know, in existing code is there uh, in many places. And what I understand from you is that is only, this is usually only used to, for long uh, uh, actions to prevent uh, heartbeat issues. Okay, so um, every thread in the OSD, when mm -hmm. it's created, it registers itself with a process-wide registry table, and or rather every work queue thread. Every time it completes an item, it goes back to the registry table, updates its live from time, and mm -hmm. if, if it goes to sleep, it marks that and goes to sleep, whatever. And then every tick, the OSD pro goes over this process table and looks for any one of these counters that hasn't been updated for at least whatever the timeout is, 60 seconds or 120 or something. Um, after one threshold, it begins warning, and it starts refusing to answer heartbeats from other OS OSDs. After a longer timeout, it suicides. Okay. So the purpose of that handle is so that long-running operations that may genuinely take too long, but not really mean, but not really indicate that the OSD is dead. It's so that they can take this handle and prove liveness every so often. So if you're listing through a PG or something, and for whatever reason you didn't want to divide this up into different items, you ping the heartbeat handle every so many items so that you can prove liveness. So if your operation doesn't have that property, then you don't need it. I understand. Uh, you, I wrote similar code in the past, so I understand. The question, uh, two questions. How long is long here? What, what time? Uh, uh... If you can't in? if you can't say ahead of time that it's bounded to a certain number of disk operations or something, then you should use the heartbeat timer to make sure it doesn't. Then you should prove lightness. Um, it's okay. not. It's probably best not to assume a particular value, but like 10 seconds would definitely be long enough that you should be pinging the timer. Okay, I don't think uh, current scrub code doesn't use it, and I don't see a reason to use it. To, the existing uh, scrub code doesn't because it it divides up the PG into manageable chunks. So instead of pinging the heartbeat timer, we return back to the thread pool and schedule ourselves for another bit of work. So that's yes. why the current code shouldn't need it. OK, the same, the same as you. The chunky uh, approach is the same I used. Uh... Yeah, precisely. OK, so I can just ignore that, uh, just, uh, that argument parameter to functions. OK, thanks. So that was the first question. The second is. Uh, to Kifu, uh, just a uh, general uh, testing issue. When you mark things as uh, Kifu testing, what tests are usually are you running to are, sat are satisfying for you? Pretty much some 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 PRs that I I I I, I believe it's safe to run in the patch. Most of them are, are, are change, changes in the area of the monitor, manager, and uh, and the liberators and uh, OSD. And okay, sometimes so it also covers the blue store changes, and uh, and also re covering the uh, the build changes. And some sometimes it covers CI changes. Something I'm interested in, and I think I, I I'm responsible for for testing them. I understand. What I'm, so you, first you are grouping them together, but what I'm asking is what sets of tests, what suits? Okay, Redos, Redos suites. Redos, Redos. Okay. Good. The coverage is like, like four or 400 te tests. And do you limit it to specific uh, uh, distribution or just for everything? Again? You are limiting uh, a specific distribution of Ubuntu or no? I I don't adding add I don't add adding a filter on the distributions or, or versions. I just let the de default. I just use the default settings. Okay, good. Thanks. But I try to to increment the the, the subset of the the the. the a tested suite every time I run the test to ensure that we have a better coverage of the test. That's it. Okay.
Um, Sam. Yep. Um, I have successfully run some random I.O. against uh, the transaction manager backed by a real disk. I was able to get a couple of tens of thousands of IOPS, which is pretty good for no optimization whatsoever. Um, it the uh, Subsequently, there are some things I need to fix, like the journal needs to actually check some. The journal needs a way to tell the difference between stuff I wrote this time I did make a fest and stuff I did last time. So I have a bunch of bookkeeping to do this week. Um, I should have a pull request for at least a very basic version of this tester. Kifu, where is the performance testing we're currently running for the perf test? I would like to add this to it. Not the version that writes to this. I want to write. A, I'm, I'm just going to have it write to an ephemeral uh, backend, but that way we can test the code path itself from commit to commit and find out whether we've added in, in instructions. So you're asking where we do that? The Jenkins thing. Oh, sure. I will, I will um, send you a mail regarding to the details where we have the test. But, uh, but if you wanted to quick answer, that's in the in the perf test under safe build. I will post new year. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I know where that is. I'll have a look. I don't think I'll be ready to do it this week, so maybe next week I'll ask you for more information. But I'll have a look at the scripts. Um, okay. And the nice thing is that you can also run it by your own using the uh, run CPT script on the script directory. Cool. Uh, that is it for me. Um, Johan. Uh, last week I was mainly uh, running the crimson thrust test and uh, fixing the, the discovered bugs, and uh, uh, I also tried to resolve the uh, the OBC lock order issue by uh, by, implement, by implement some some kind of uh, sequencer to order the client requests repeat, and uh, that's all for me. I also um, leave some 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 comment to your uh, recovery uh, fixes PR. Uh, okay, I see. Uh, um, I saw I saw those comments. Thank you, uh, Inxing. Uh, yeah, last week uh, for the Ono tree, I I implemented uh, the typed uh, Delta recorder classes for replay, and currently working on uh, encoding and uh, decoding data. Uh, and I'm still drafting the uh, PMAM enhanced C-store design. And uh, for a multiple for Crimson Messenger, I, I proposed uh, uh, possible design changes and rationales in the M2 mapping doc. So uh, if you have time, you can take a look and review. That's all for me. I'm I'm not following you re regarding to the um messenger ch messenger changes. What is it mm -hmm. re related? You just mentioned it you to, have some. Yes. Yeah, it's to how to uh, because currently messenger is is only running on one core and uh, ah. in multiple core OSDs we we need to make it to run across cores. So there are some changes side. Yeah, I recall we do we, we did have some some uh, some creators, some factories for, for creating the, the the messenger which works across course, right? But that that's that's separate messengers. It's that's Okay, that's anyhow one I, I, messenger per shard, but not the Yeah. They work independently, but uh, that's not true if we want to uh, use the current Redos protocol, because under the current Redos protocol, we cannot expose multiple ports. Okay. Because current connection is per, uh, per OSD or per client. Even the OSD has multiple cores. Okay. Do you imagine that we will have a like like large changes if we change the the way how the client talk to 
different ports by 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 PGs, mapping to PGs, like shot by by. Shot that that by requires radio protocol change, so I don't think yes, it I, will be the first step. Okay, I just wondering if we our, could uh, foresee some 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 large changes on the messenger side if we wanted to do have the change in in the short term, long term. Okay, anyhow, I will take a like, take a take a look at your changes. Have you created PR for your messenger changes? No, I just proposed the designs for discussion. Okay. In the uh, in the pad. Oh, gotcha. And by the way, Sam, did you get a chance to to review and merge the uh, the uh, allocator? Changed in a safe, a safe attribute. I think it will help to. to uh, I the, think the I allocation. looked at it, but I wasn't really competent. I'll uh, try to take a look. Uh, ping me on it. I think you did, but I. Yeah, I did. Um. Anything else? Before we jump into the uh, recovery, uh, yeah, okay. I wanted to correct a few mistakes I made earlier. Um, I'm wrong. Blue Store doesn't expose an op sequencer anymore. That was in the past. These days, it um, it maintains an internal mapping from call T to the op sequencer object, and it populates that on boot using the set of C nodes. Um, so Chun Mei, those C node objects serve exactly one purpose. On startup, the Blue Store scans those keys and uses it to initialize the collection map and the setup op sequencers. So, if for us to do that, all we would really have to do is create like a single block array of PGT bits map, uh, that is PGT C node pairs. And C node is literally just the set of bits associated with the PGID. There really isn't a lot to it. Does that make sense? The only thing Bluestore is actually storing is in the key, it has the PGID, and then in the value, it has this encoded Bluestore C node T, which is just a 32 bit int indicating the number of bits of the placement group are significant. That is, if it says two, then. Um, wait. I don't remember which way. So, so Sam, Sam, you think we still need the collection, right? We still need the I'm, collection. I'm ambivalent. So it literally, as far as I can tell, only does these two things. Um, we need a way to indicate ordering, and ordering and object sets happen to be the same thing. So in that sense, the call T structure that the interface uses to communicate with users is appropriate. Two things submit, two operations submitted on objects within the same collection are meant to be ordered. But that thing I just said does not require writing it down. The writing it down part is so that we can quickly list the set of collections on OSD startup. That part is sort of orthogonal and could be handled another way. Um, but I think for now, the laziest way to do it would simply be to add another block type that just lists uh, collections. Assume it's bounded, don't worry about it if it's too big, throw an error, we can fix it later. The number of collections you can fit in a single block is probably quite large, so I'm not really that worried about it. PGT is what, 64 bits? And the bits part is another 32, so it's probably like 128 bits max per PG. And you can fit quite a few of those in 4,096 bits, bytes. Does that make sense? Uh, or maybe so I need time to get there to think. So there's only cup, like couple block blocks in in that one category. Block. We'll just yes, call it one, one block, block in this case. It won't work in, lo in the long term. We'll have to do something slightly smarter, make it a tree or something. But I, I'm really not that concerned about it. Performance doesn't matter here. It's only read on startup. And it's only written when you create a new PG. This isn't a fast path thing. Um, and since this is not... only single. Oh, sorry, please go on. What's up? 
since there is only single uh, block in that in that block type, so we we don't need a, a addressing for for that block. No matter or, it's a logic totally addressing or, or physical addressing. Addressing that already exists. We use the transaction manager. The same thing as anything else. Just use a well known uh, 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 number or whatever we're currently using. I'm not really worried about it. Mm. It's the same as the O node root, or yeah, it's the same as the O node. Yeah. Root. It's a special block. Yeah. It's pointed yeah. to from somewhere else, or we just know the number of it. Either yeah, way, it's fine with me. A single root of node. That's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Um, or we could do something else. I don't really care. Or it's it's like it's not like a big deal because again, its only purpose is to initialize the uh, collections list on 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 startup. There are likely other ways to do that as 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 well. You could write to a file that's specified somewhere in a config directory, for instance. Yeah. Because it's not rapidly changed. Um, I, I, I think the, the easiest solution is to, to just add a new block type for now. Easy. Um, does that make any, any sense, Chunmei? So the yeah, in-memory structures and the on-disk structures serve completely different purposes. They used to be separate. Back, or before, I think, 2013, uh, most of these interfaces took both a collection and an op sequencer. They were independent. And the collection denoted an actual on-disk folder. But none of that's true anymore. These days, we use a shared namespace for all of the objects in the entire OSD. There's no folder structure. And for us, there won't be, for instance, like they'll all be in the same ONO tree, in other words. So the only things left are this ordering concept, which is still useful, and the ability to list the set of current PGs, which is also useful. And we use collections for both of them. So at least at first, for now, we're going to ignore the sequencing part because all operations will be considered sequenced. Um, so that will be fine. The longer term thing will be that, uh, or, so that, that part's fine. The only, the only thing we have to do with collections, I think, is be able to list them. That is what we'll see. Go ahead. Uh, in the in the root block, uh, there is a pointer pointed to one block to just uh, save the collections information. Yeah, I think so. No, because it's not big enough. The number is not big. Uh, it's uh, maybe several hundred. Yeah, it shouldn't be bigger than that. It, I mean, it's this is clumsy. We will want it to be a tree or something later. But mm -hmm. this is fine for now. It's just not important enough to spend a lot of engineering effort on. Not yet. OK. And if there's some other way we can bootstrap the OSD in the meantime, that would allow us to skip even that part. So I would be open to suggestions on that score as well. Can we also can we store the uh, the the PG list? Let me put it this way: as long with the super block. That's basically what we're doing. Yeah. You could actually rewrite the super block. That would be fine. Be ambivalent about this. I think they are, they fall into the same category for the, the well. Or, super or blocks are typically two. super blocks are typically small, fixed size, and depending wow. Im, 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 immutable. So this isn't really a super block thing, but I'm fine with abusing the super block for now. Because you mentioned it's a very small, so it's a, it's a, it's well, a bound, the boundary, the size is bound, bounded. It's not actually. It's just that for all practical intents and purposes for testing, it won't be big because it's really, really stupid to create a huge number of PGs on an OSD. But in real life, that does happen occasionally, and it's unacceptable for an OSD to crash under those those circumstances. So we have to tolerate large numbers of collections eventually, yeah, but we don't have to yeah. do it like this year. We can do that in January or February once other stuff is working. Mm, makes sense. I mean, we could also just have it be a special object inside of D Store and have it use the existing, like once we have OMAP functionality, then we already have a scalable key to value mapping. We don't really have to write a bespoke one if we do it that way. See what I mean? 
like C-Store itself internally could have a special otherwise inaccessible object that it uses for storing this kind of control information. That would be even better. That way we don't have to write extra code. Yes. Okay. Do you see what I mean by that, Chun Mei? Oh, I agree. Yeah, so that would be my favorite answer, actually. If we put this off until your OMAP code lands, then we don't have to write anything special for this at all, which would be even better. OMAP code? I, uh, I'm saying that, okay, so imagine that your OMAP code is already in the tree. So we could modify CStore to create a special internal object that is in the ONO tree and everything that isn't accessible from the OSD. And we could just stick the PG information in that, into the OMAP section, or the data section for that matter. I don't really feel that strongly about it, but that would work. Yeah. Do you see what the I mean? OMAP section. Because OMAP is a, is a, is a, a dictionary by, by nature, so we can iterate yeah. across to read. That's a nice thing. Although the optimization isn't especially important because, again, the numbers here shouldn't be big. So if we have to rewrite the entire collection set every time we add or remove one, I can't say I'd lose a lot of sleep over that. Okay. We are keeping the whole collection set in memory at all times. So it's not expensive. At least it, it, it shouldn't be expensive to do that. So I would also be fine with just, like, writing it to the data payload of an object, too. That would be totally acceptable using the extent map. So, May, are you waiting for a review from me on the extent map, by the way? I forgot. Oh, review what? Are you waiting for a review from me? I forget extent whether the extent tree. map object merged. No, you are waiting for review. Okay. Oh, my tree is there. waiting for review. Oh, no, Omap extent tree. map merged. Okay, cool. Extent tree is merged and that PR is merged. Wait. Cool. Did you want to talk about the EIO stuff? Have no. Mm, yes. Um, first thing. Uh, one second. Let me take a look here. Put up. Yeah, so I guess the, the first thing I just want to clarify when we. In classical OSD, we um, we put the the PG in in state uh, in repair state. One EIO. Um, yes. Yeah, so you have uh, so when you get EIO, you call a function called rep repair primary object, um, and one of the thing one of the things it, it does is is uh, set the PG state to repair. One, my question, so my question is one, uh, why and two, what are the consequences of putting the, the PG state in repair? I am not sure. That sounds like a Ronan question. Ronan, I think you've had more uh, experience with this bit of code than I have recently. I can't, I can't answer offhand. I try to... I don't know if you want to talk with me later on the phone, we try to, I try to answer. So offhand, I believe the goal here is when you see an EIO, you want to trigger a scrub and then a repair on the object, right? So I suspect yeah. that's what's going on. Um, so you'd have to read the classic Ceph code to work out how the scrub then actually happens. That I am not sure about. Does it queue for scrub or otherwise change the scrub state? There is a so what it does? Currently, there is a flag that is checked uh, the uh, finish uh, repair uh, or fin how is it called? Finish something. Uh, uh -huh. There is a flag that is checked and triggers a scrub. Yeah, this would be before that. Hang on a sec. Uh, Avnon, is this in the normal I/O path or is this during a scrub? 
Uh, no, so it's in the normal. So it's in the normal um, I/O path when you try to do, um, let's say, read or sparse read. Uh, if you get an EIO from the object store, then you, you call a rep repair, which does the which does the which changes the state of the PG, and then tries to uh, start a, a, a peering a, a peering event. Robert. Sorry, uh, repeat that again. I, I said that um, it is in the regular I/O path. For example, if you try to do read or sparse read in uh, in primary log PG, and you get an EIO, then you call a rep prepare primary object, which is the function I'm talking about, which does essentially the um, marks the the object as missing. Um, um, saves the 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 ops that came through for the object, changes the state of the PG, and starts the peering event. Starts peering essentially. Yeah. I see. Okay. okay. It's because this is the mechanism. This is the mecha. Okay. So this this must be the way repair works these days. This is new to uh, to me. I suspect what's going on is that when you queue recovery, when the PG is in state repair, it looks for, gotta be adding this somewhere, right? Ah, it marks the object missing a little bit above that, which triggers the existing log-based recovery logic to re-recover the object. And then, Ronan, to your point, I believe at the end, it will kick off a scrub. Yeah, Unless I'm mistaken. About this, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, you helped me with that function. Uh, yeah. But does it? But, but does it? Will it block any further requests coming of, to to the PG or? No. Or all it does, because all it does, is just the next time we are doing a scrub, hey, notice this PG is in repair and we should handle that. Neither. What it's going to do is it's going to mark that specific object non-present on the OSD. So if another read or write comes in on that object, it will be blocked until that's no longer true. At the same time, it queues a peering event, which causes the PG to go into recovery, which will cause it to mm -hmm. recover any missing objects, this one. It will not block IO on any other object. The, okay. the, the OSD is perfectly capable of serving IOs on other objects that are not the one being recovered. Okay, so the... so. When when I looked at at OSD types where PG state repair is defined, that was kind of kind of confusing because it says PG should repair on next scrub. So that yeah. is why I... this is an abuse of the flag. So the way this is supposed to work is when you have the repair state set, um, it the next time through the, when it's when it, the scrub starts, it will mark any problematic objects it, it, it sees, and then kick off a recovery. This is using the second half of that machinery without doing the first half. So this is a little bit sneaky, I would say. Having noticed so, this, I recommend that you submit a PR updating the document, the documentation. Wait, me? Yes. Having observed uh, now that it was misleading, I recommend that you go ahead and fix it. Oh, okay. I thought you said I really – yeah. So what I, you're saying is that, that, that it's just – um, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say you're probably going to spend some time reading into this and making sure you understand how it works really well. So as part of that, you may as well fix the documentation. Yep. Sounds good. Uh, what I was just about to ask is – so you're saying that this is just uh, our way to um, – to mark the object as missing. Yep, sort that's of. what's going on. Yeah, no, uh, literally as missing. Uh, one moment. Where does it actually do that? Primary error, I believe. If you follow that primary error, error call. Yes. Um, okay. Do so, Kefu, okay, that that and recovery state dot force object missing. If you follow that thread back into OSD, wherever whatever file that's that that's in, you'll see that it crams it back into the missing stuff. Go ahead. Uh, I was just saying, uh, careful. So does that answer your uh, question from yesterday? Yeah. Because uh, 
by looking at the peering state dot h, I find that this clean state move, move, moves to to weight local recovery reserved if 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 a do recovery event comes in. That's, that's why yes. I, I, I thought it might mark the, the PG in, in the unavailable state to prevent from, no. from serving further requests from clients. So the, the, the larger scale summary of how this, this, this works is that um, the time during which PGs do not serve IO is the time during which they do not know which objects are up to date and which ones aren't. This is generally called peering. So by the time peering completes, we know exactly which objects on the primary are up to date and which ones aren't. So at that point, we begin serving I.O. And if we see an I.O. on an object that is not up to date, then we block it until recovery completes on that object. But otherwise, we continue serving I.O. Okay. While doing recovery in, in uh, concurrent. And, and so Sam, is... only, only the primary PG can, uh, only the primary uh, can uh, trigger uh, uh, peering, right? You'll have to be careful with the term trigger peering, because strictly speaking, no OSD can. Peering happens when an OSD map comes in that changes the interval set. So actually, it's a cluster-wide signal. This is not peering. This is reinitializing recovery, and that is primary specific state. The primary is free to do this at its own anytime it, it wants. Um, I think the question you're probably asking, though, is what happens if an EIO occurs on a replica? Exactly. And the answer at the moment, I believe, is that there's no good handling for it. Um, EIOs sort of fundamentally can't happen on a write the same way. It would mean the store is dead. Um, so that kind of kills the OSD, which sort of solves the problem because, you know, the OSD fails and we do failover. But there isn't anything like this repair path, primarily because we don't do replica reads in the first place, but also because... The replica would have to somehow propagate this information back to the primary, which is, of course, possible, but would require quite a bit of code. So it hasn't been implemented. Yeah, that's why I guess in in classical in the classical code we have an assert that checks if it's the primary, and if not, then it just dies. Uh, yeah, yeah. And in a lot of ways, that's an acceptable behavior because mostly disks don't partially fail at this granularity. And it doesn't mean a whole host fails. It just means that specific OSD and therefore that specific disk failed. So failover is appropriate. Um, but yeah, it's an area that could be improved. You probably shouldn't try to tackle that as part of this part of your uh, project, though. I would try to replicate the existing behavior. So, so Kef, do you agree that, that we should, in terms of the, the actual implementation of the function that I showed you yesterday, yeah. With with urgent recovery, uh, and the um, and the state set and peering and local peering event, should we keep that the same? I'm not quite sure regarding to to using the the repair state machine. This part of a repair the, the part of a state machine to do the, this job, the, but the, but uh, if it uh, makes things easier, I, I'm I'm inclined to do it the same way. But uh, well, it's I, it's mostly correct. Like most of the stuff, normal that that is it's it's not as much of a stretch as it looks like. Um, we genuinely don't have a copy of this object at this time, right? Because we can't read it. So right. the recovery path is appropriate here. Um, the only part that's a little cute is using PG state repair here because that is an abuse of the flag. That isn't really what that flag was meant for. But for now, it's okay, I think. But Sam, Particularly... I, I do have a concern because we do the, we handle a different type of uh, um, object. Like we, if we run into a missing object, which does not exist in, uh, in, in this host, but it exists some, some, some other peers, we do, we do to start a urgent recovery, which pulls the, the object from this peer and then serve it so the service that okay. kind of using the put the put the object, we do do it in in this in this way. But when it comes to a uh, CRC mismatch failure, we we put the PG into recovery and start a recovery process using the what's same machine. What's recovery? Where is that code? That's new to me. Um, client request. Uh, let me find it. That's in crimson. 
Ah, uh, yes. Yes, so that's incredible. That we, we handle different, in, different cases using different machinery. That's that. Uh, ah, that's confusing. Then I think, yes, you should use that machinery. This should behave, I think, like an object on a missing, or a read on a missing object. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize that's how that worked. So it, well, how does it work then? Find the, uh, the code. Urgent. You could go to um, client underscore request dot cc. So if I'm posting the I don't see urgent. Name, ah, urgent recovery. You could find it in the, by symbol, by symbol name. So at the line um, 135. Where's urgent recovery de defined? Um, um, I think that's in background re recovery. Uh, wait, let me take a look here. Uh, go to client underscore request dot cc and go to the definition of a client request. Come on, come on, process underscore op. You will see mm. where we start an operation for urgent recovery. E yes, but I think he means where the class is defined, and Sam, that would no, be. No, I, I already found it. Okay. Um, yes, that does seem more appropriate. You'll have to think a bit to make sure that there isn't other behavior in Classic we need, but I don't see any that's obvious to me. You um, will, of course, still need to handle the part where you add it to the missing set, or this won't work. But yes, I agree that simply, if, if this is what we do on a... Yeah, if this is what we do on a... Uh, on a read on a missing object, that's the best option here. There's not, there's no analog to that in classic. Yeah. So, so if I, I thought that that this uh, that this um, uh, urgent recovery thing is the um, is the equivalent of our uh, wait for uh, waiting for unreadable object queue in classical OST. It's not. I mean, it's, sorry, the waiting for unreadable object queue in classical OSD is just one piece. That's just the queue objects go onto. When you complete recovery, you pull everything for that object the back off the queue and requeue them. But that's yes. not what do recovery here does. This actually triggers the messages that go to the replica to do the operation. They're yeah. they're distinct things. Yes, I understood that it does it, that it does more. It actually adds to immediately adds the object to the the to the recovery queue, um, but it does it achieve also what what uh, uh, what we were doing in classical OSD with the peering after setting. It doesn't do peering. That's what I was telling you. It kicks recovery off. Ah, it's not a peering. That's how, it what, can't what do peering. There was no there was no OSD, OSD map, right? All it's doing is kicking itself back into the state where it scans the missing objects and recovers them. Okay. The real question is, why doesn't Classic do this? Wait for unreadable object totally calls, no, no, wait for unreadable object calls maybe kick recovery, which does exactly what this code does, this urgent recovery thing. This is definitely a thing in Classic too. So I don't really understand why that EIO handler in Classic doesn't just call maybe kick recovery. I think we should ask David. He yeah. has added this. Uh, Will we thing. still need to mark the object as as missing with the state uh, with the PG state repair? No, you don't need the PG state repair here. So essentially, like said, all the yeah, all... repair thing was just a little cute trick to make sure that when the object was recovered, it would kick off scrub. And it's not that's not a that's not a trick we need to reproduce. So is everything that we're going to need for this function is basically this urgent recovery machinery? No, you also need to mark the object missing and do any other bookkeeping required to prevent the OSD from crashing. What I'm telling you is that the specific thing Classic OSD is doing here is overkill. We don't actually need to transition all the way back into uh, all the way back into the recovery state. Not 
since there is apparently code to do a recovery without that. You'll still be you'll still need to read through this code and make sure you understand everything that that's going on. You'll need to read through the client pipeline and make certain that it will block at the appropriate place if there's another operation on this object in the meantime. And you'll need to make sure that finishing that completing the recovery of the object will wake the op the op back up. And then write a test for it, of course, so that it actually works. But I think that urgent recovery do recovery here is the right choice. I think that will do the job. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, but but the, the the second the second part to my to my question is, I I thought of doing this the the, the handling in in. So okay, wait. Let me let me start this uh, differently. This this in classical OSD, this function can, could actually return uh, e again, if uh, for example that we are uh, blocked by the 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 PG state. Um, if it's not clean and it's not backfilling or recovering, then it returns e again. And what it does in classical OSD is completely restarts. It completely re restarts the opt. Um, do you think that that we should do something similar to that in Crimson as well? By you tell me why is it doing that? Um, well, to my understanding, I I think that it does that because well, it restarts the entire op because maybe the 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 object was already maybe the object was recovered perhaps by the time we 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 call the op again um because maybe someone maybe someone else already triggered recovery for that object no it's because this code when it calls q peering event it's going to transition us back into the recovery state in the peering state machine no this is not peering it's the thing the peering state machine is the name for the entire state machine that describes all of the possible states for the pg only a small subset of that is is actually peering so the state we go back into is called recovery, and it's the state we're in when we're doing this thing where we iterate over the missing step and recovering all the relevant objects. So if we're not clean, we are very likely in that process already. So if we didn't check for this and we went straight through, we'd end up recover we'd, we'd end up transitioning back into recovery already, even though we're already in it. So what's actually going on here is it's saying, oh, we're already doing recovery. It's too complicated to handle this case. So what we're going to do is we're going to block the op until we're done doing recovery, hit an EIO again, and then trigger recovery again to handle it. <clears throat> so that we don't have to interrupt the currently running recovery process, as that would be complicated for, you know, just a, an infrequent Wait, EIO but, path. But it is not guaranteed that we will get EIO again, right? Like. When That's we correct. restart the op, that, that there is the possibility that that the object hypothetically will already be yeah, okay. Yeah, in which case, great, we return and so be it. So, so given that explanation, is that part necessary? Um, you mean in 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 crimson? Yes. I think it depends on the contract between the client and the OSD. It doesn't. Uh, and the op's going to be restarted when we finish recovery anyway. That's what this urgent recovery thing does. This isn't about restarting the op. This is about whether we block waiting for clean before we try. You mean from the client's perspective, right? The client do doesn't see any of this. Um, no, what's it, going it on does. here? What part? The, um, I'm. I'm just now, when you guys are discussing, I'm looking at the the code pass in primary log PG. Try to understand if the E again comes back to, to client. I think the answer is it does. It doesn't. That block for clean means that it goes onto a wait list waiting for clean. When we actually become clean, it will come off the wait list and be rerun. So That's the, the same the, back to do up. This, all the ops. Encoded by the uh, request will be start Re from scratch. Exactly. Oh, 
assuming they don't have any inside it's like oh no they don't they can't we didn't submit a transaction right okay this so, is how this is how absolutely all op blocking works we put ourselves onto one of several block block lists and then we return e again the corresponding code so for clean when the on clean handler i believe will pick everything up off of this list and requeue it if it's on the waiting for active list the on active state will pick up everything off of the waiting for active list and put it back into the queue so it's a sort of a two part handoff this code puts the op out of the queue and it says e again we'll handle it later and then the corresponding code elsewhere in the osd will wake it back up when it needs to okay. very very carefully so as to make sure that it doesn't reorder the ops I think the better, so this, better way to handle this is to to just wait on the shared shared future as we did uh, in the when hand, when when handling the EIO oh, sorry the missing object or unreadable object in in a client request that would be simple right? No. You'd have to deal with the possibility that you have a bunch of different operations that are part way through. For instance, these operation states record things like the current version of the of the PG. I mean, if you want to architect it that way, you probably could, but you won't be able to copy anything from classic OSD if you do it uh, that way. No, I'm not trying to copy this thing from classic OSD. I'm trying to reuse the machinery in handling urgent, urgent recovery. Hmm. But urgent recovery does the same thing here, right? Oh, with blocking future. Yeah. Wait a minute. It creates a shared future in, uh, in a central place. So we can wait yeah, I mean, that part's time. certainly true. I am concerned about that. What happens if another object, if, well, hmm. uh, Sam, what okay. are you? Well, looking? either way, either way, if you're using the, the uh, future concept here, then this not is clean part that block for clean would simply wait on a future that's all that's going on there so like i said this isn't really about the waiting part the client never sees these these e, e, uh, e agains it's just a way of suspending the operation until the condition clears so amnon is this is clean condition important given the change with urgent recovery um well can you just Explain, explain what do you mean with the change with urgent recovery? There is a sure difference in behavior we are proposing here. In classic OSD, we actually requeue the full recovery operate the full recovery state and run it from beginning to end. What we are proposing <laughs> to do here is to use the already existing urgent recovery code to use the path we use when we see a read on an object that needs uh, on an object that. Um, so you read on an object that is not present. Mm -hmm. Okay, so given what I explained before about why we do this is clean check, is that still relevant? Um, sorry. Uh, well, I don't think I don't think so in this case. If um, if I, if I if I if I understand uh, correctly. In classical OSD, when we, when we restart the whole thing, it is possible that that the that the PG state uh, changed well, while that's, we did that. That's also true here. True either way. Every time we give up control, it's possible that a OSD map came in and changed the PG state. Just literally always true. So I, the core difference is that because this urgent recovery operation is designed to run on an object that is not present while we are doing recovery it is not a problem to run it while recovery is happening so we don't need this clean check the reason why classic is doing this classic osd is doing this is because this trick where it transitions back into recovery wouldn't work properly if we were already in re recovery do you see the difference um can, can you explain again the, the first part of of what you explained about urgent recovery. Okay, what is that operation for? Why is it in the code base? What is it used for? Um, well, to to add the the object to the uh, 
uh, to uh, to the recovery queue? There's no queue in Crimson here. None that I see anyway. But we careful. Is it not when we walked over yeah. the the code? We saw it's that there a, is. Like a, a I think it's more like a map for for collecting the uh, object being recovered. Are you talking about the PG missing sub? Let me check out the pit backend recovery backend. It should be a number variable of pit backend recovery backend. Hold on. The recover object, yeah, it adds it to a map, but the main thing it does is it sends messages, right? It actually sends messages to the replicas saying, please send me back the data for this object. So I'm not sure that it adds it to the queue is really an appropriate description here. What it's doing is it's doing the operation we normally use during the recovery state without actually waiting for the recovery process to get to it. And the reason why it exists in Crimson and indeed in Classic is because Immediately after we transition into the acting state, if we get a, a, a client read on an object, we would really like to recover that object immediately. We don't really want to wait for the right. log recovery to just kind of get to it, right? So we right. just instantly send the messages and be done with it. That's what urgent recovery is doing here. By contrast, the code we were looking at in classic OSD doesn't do that. It adds it to the to the missing set that the PG will eventually use to do recovery. And then it um, kicks off the state that causes that very background recovery to happen. The reason for that on clean check is because if we're not clean, then we're already recovering and that little trick won't work. It will mess up the existing recovery process. So we simply wait until it ends. In Crimson, we don't need to do that because we can simply use this operation, which is specifically designed to work in par it currently with a, an ongoing recovery. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, even the context though we is different, so same, it's not necessary. Even though we could have done the same in, in classic OSD, because you're saying that we have something similar, right? Yeah, like we have the we same operation. Have, but we're not actually using it there for some yeah, reason. I don't know why we aren't. That's a question for David. There probably is a good reason. For instance, it might be really annoying to trigger scrub after that particular pathway. And remember, this was probably intended as a backport to a stable branch, so there was value in using a minimal patch. The same is not true for us. So if we want to adapt scrub to be something we can kick off at the end of this, then that's probably something we can just do. It's not a huge deal. Sorry, I was trying to talk through more. Th I don't want to make categorical statements about the right way to do this, because hopefully you'll read quite a bit of this code and you may come to a different conclusion. So I'm just trying to lay out my reasoning and which things I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at so that you can uh, probably disagree with me as you learn more about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So are, so you're saying that, that, that in this case as well, a client request should not be aware of anything that 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 is being done with regards to this EIO handling, right? Neither, not not even like the E again. No, and classic OSD doesn't propagate that back to the client. If you go read do up or do OSD ops, one or the other, that return code is caught and dropped because it means that something somewhere in the handling pipeline stuck this up on a queue somewhere, and it's something we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it later. Duo's, Duop doesn't really care. All it knows is that it's not its problem any, any, uh, anymore. And, and does urgent recovery in our case do, this, the, do the same? Um, in the sense that it is designed to, to allow the operation to continue afterwards, yes. My suggestion would be to reschedule the op afterwards, though. Um, Kifu, to your question, it's because if the, the op may have had multiple reads embedded in it, and it might be a little bit tricky 
Well, or maybe not. Maybe it's okay to just read it like a really long write. But one of the problems, for instance, is that you're holding a read lock on the object, right? When you're doing a read? True? Pifu? Yes. So you need to drop the read lock to do recovery. And uh, I ah. really think the easiest way to do it, and that's not the only state we have to drop. Like, there's an object context we got to drop. We might have been making modifications to an object context as we went because we're right. projecting the result of a, of a read modify write. And I just, it's difficult to reason about precisely what in that state you have to reset after you resume. And I'd kind of prefer not to. I'd really rather just start over, especially for something yeah. like an EIO, which is meant to be rare. Writing special handling for this seems like wasted work. Yes, the simple approach is to scratch, start from scratch and drop all the lock we are holding. I think that's going to be, I think that's going to be the best solution for every op. Either the op mm -hmm. runs to completion without uh, errors or weird conditions, or if we find we have to suspend it, we just, we, we abandon our current work and start over once the condition clears. Yes, probably, because if we were to want to cut a corner and to be more efficient in this, in this case, we can probably promote the, the log to, to close the log if we want to uh, repair it, but that's not always true because there is some other hold of the log. Might well, and there are a lot of these conditions. That's, that's my, yeah. my concern is that there are a lot of these conditions and only some of them, only for some of them does that make sense. But the larger yeah, yeah. point is that I don't really care about optimizing for rare cases. I don't think it's worth writing code for. It's just maintenance, right? EIO, yes, EIO and the corruption. Well, EIO and, and even receiving a read on an object we have to do recovery on. Like, I don't really care how long it takes to schedule the op, because in the meantime, we spent a bunch of time and energy recovering the object itself. That's going to be the dominant cost. Now the relatively small cost of simply redoing perhaps an IO we already did. Which notably would be to uh, cached state, so it's unlikely to be expensive anyway. Yes, that's so, a good point. Are you saying that it's not really important when we try to do the uh, the op on the object again? You're saying we should it just is. schedule it and... Um, um, for now, I think, Emon, you should do whatever the current do recovery user does. But in the longer term, as we go back through and start fixing bugs in this, I want to think and I, I, I want to do this thing where we just reschedule the uh, operation from scratch. I think Joy Han is working on that. Or wait, no, that's the. This is okay, something we discussed a few weeks ago. It's just work yet to be done. So yes, you don't need to pick a, this up. It's in my as, plate. Yeah, you don't need to pick this up as part of your PR. You can just do whatever the code currently does. Okay. Which is to say you wait for the do recovery operation to complete, do whatever cleanup you need to do, and continue on with the operation. Because do recovery will return a future, right? So you just block on it like any other I.O. Mm -hmm. Okay. So definitely I'm going to I'm gonna make a do uh, document, like you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, you and may then, find that it helps to clarify things if you have some kind of a flow diagram too, the uh, an ASCII thing. Yeah, so I'll 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 try I'll I'll, I'll read more through the code because mm -hmm. I think there are some some parts that that I missed and and hopefully if the re this recording will be available soon then I'll also go back to what we discussed and then I'll I'll make a document and share it. With you cool. uh, send me an email when you've got questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I yeah. guess that's pretty much it on, on this matter, unless anybody else has any other questions. Not from me. Okay. Anything else? So. Okay, talk to you later, and have a good one. Thank you guys. Bye, guys. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.